Okay. Thank you, thank you. So we are going to start directly uh, with the topic of homeostasis, okay, which is the central topic of physiology. If you make a survey to different physiology professors and they have to choose one topic, only one topic to teach, they are going to choose homeostasis, which is simply the study of how different variables are regulated in the body to try to maintain them uh, within a range of normal values. Okay, homeostasis, if you take the word, it means staying the same, but actually there is nothing in our body that stays the same until we die. Okay, when we die, everything's gonna stay the same for a while. The blood's not gonna move, the air is not gonna go in and out, and of course at the end, you know what happens after we die, but when you have everything stable, static, okay, means there is no life because life is dynamic, life is change, okay, all of the variables in the body are going up and down, up and down around a value that is, let's say, like the mean, like the average value, okay, there is like an oscillation of these variables, temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, sugar levels, hormone levels, they are oscillating, okay, uh, and this process that maintains these variables oscillating, okay, fluctuating within predictable ranges, okay, sometimes uh, maintaining the variables within a very narrow range, that dynamic process is what we call homeostasis. So today we are going to study that. We are going to be seeing the difference between equilibrium and steady state, okay, most importantly in terms of energy expenditure. Uh, for example, to maintain an equilibrium, you don't need to spend energy. Okay, if you simply open a, a container that contains a cologne, okay, that cologne, that smell is gonna simply diffuse, okay, from high concentration to low concentration. There is no need to spend energy for that. But if you need to do the contrary, okay, if you need to put a substance from a place where it's in low concentration to a place where it is in high concentration against the concentration gradient, you need to spend a lot of energy for that. Okay, we are gonna be seeing examples of different homeostatic processes and the general mechanisms that regulate homeostasis. Positive, negative feedback. Okay, and even if we don't cover many examples today, in every lecture, in every system, we are going to be seeing examples of how homeostasis works. So you are going to be able to predict changes in variables, either if they are regulated by positive or negative feedback. And then we are going to be talking about also the body compartments, the body fluid compartments, okay, how the body manages to maintain the differences between them and the exact distribution of fluids, electrolytes, different substances uh, in different compartments. Okay, and at the end we are going to be talking about cell communication, but that's going to be also the main topic of the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system. So briefly we are going to talk today about that, but that is going to be something that's going to this is something that we are going to be developing with more detail in other chapters. So, take a look at these uh, images. Okay, on the left, you have the classic image of the human body divided in different uh, cavities or compartments okay, that you study in anatomy. And on the right, you have another representation of the human body Okay, but in this case, the division is not thoracic, cranial, abdominal, pelvic cavity. It is intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid, and the subdivision of the extracellular fluid into interstitial fluid and plasma. Okay, this is a representation of two different points of view about the human body. On the left, you have a representation of the human body by anatomists, and on the right, you have a representation of the human body by physiologists. 
It's important to know that anatomy and physiology are two completely different sciences with two completely different origins. Um, in many schools, in many colleges, in many places, they are studied together. And I particularly consider that that is a mistake. Because if you are teaching one thing, it's very difficult to teach the other. When you are talking about structure, description, it's very difficult to, at the same time, cover properly the function. Okay, And if you notice, in these two diagrams, we have a two totally different points of view. For a, an anatomist, the important thing is relationship between different organs, what is on top, what is below, what is to the right, what is inside, what is outside. For a physiologist, that doesn't exist. For a physiologist, the human body is a bunch of fluids surrounded by a membrane, that is the skin, okay? And this is subdivided into a big compartment, that is the intracellular fluid volume, that is separated by something that we call the cell membrane from other big compartment, that is the extracellular fluid volume, okay, that contains the interstitial fluid, so the fluid that is between the cells, and the plasma volume, that is the fluid that is within the blood vessels. The plasma is separated from the interstitial fluid by the endothelium, Okay, so these membranes that separate compartments, the composition of the fluids, the volume of the fluids, the chemical reactions that occur within each of these compartments, that is what physiology studies. Okay, we are not so interested in specific things like anatomists do. And this is my representation of the human body, okay, that tries to make this diagram a bit more understandable. Okay, here we have a cell that is representing the intracellular compartment. Notice that you have there the nucleus, you have the cell membrane with this double layer of phospholipids. And here we have the different electrolytes that are abundant inside the cells, magnesium, phosphate, potassium. And then we have here a blood vessel with the endothelium separating the intravascular space from the interstitial fluid. And you have there the components of the intravascular space, bicarbonate, chloride, sodium, blood cells, and of course the plasma, which is the clear space in between. In between the cells and the blood vessels, we have the interstitial space, Notice that there we have more or less the same electrolytes that we have inside the blood cells, the blood vessels, bicarbonate, sodium, and chloride. Okay, and they are normally being constantly exchanged. Okay, so these electrolytes in the interstitial space and in the intravascular space, they are in a constant equilibrium, moving in and out by diffusion, facilitate the diffusion, these passive transport mechanisms. Now, how do we maintain the difference between the extracellular and the intracellular compartment? Why we have inside the cells a set of electrolytes that is totally different from the set of electrolytes that is outside the cells? Well, that has to be maintained by this structure that we have here that is the sodium potassium pump that uses a lot of energy to maintain this difference. That difference between these compartments, intra and extracellular, is what we call steady state. Okay, so keep that concept in mind first. There is an equilibrium between the intravascular and, in the, inter and the interstitial fluid that is maintained by simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or passive transport without energy. And there is a condition of steady state that makes the difference, or allows us to maintain the difference between the intracellular and the extracellular compartments. Sodium potassium pump using lots of energy. 
if this sodium potassium pump stops working, an equilibrium will be reached okay, between the extra and intracellular compartments, and that is essentially death. Okay? Because none of the functions of the body are possible if this difference doesn't exist. And we are going to see examples, many, many examples, during our physiology course. So, the definition of homeostasis is simply all the processes that the body does to maintain a dynamic equilibrium okay, around these set points that are established, for example, by the hypothalamus, by the brain, by the endocrine system, okay, and different processes that try to counteract, to oppose any variation outside or inside the body, okay, any condition that changes or alters the variables that we are trying to regulate, okay, are going to be uh, taken back to normality by these different processes. The final purpose of these homeostatic processes is simply to facilitate the work of the cells. Sometimes I like to compare this to what happens, happens in the... Yes? Did someone ask anything? Sometimes I like to compare this to what happens, for example, in any of our cities. Okay, let's compare the intracellular space to any of our houses and the extracellular to the street, the highways. Okay, it is the function of the government to keep the street safe and clean so we can go to work and come back or go to have dinner and come back. But it is our function and our business, okay, to have our houses clean and organized and with furniture, etc. Okay, so the purpose of the government with the laws and the police, etc., is to guarantee that we as citizens, okay, when we go out, there is no garbage, there is no danger, the streets are properly uh, fixed and there is a proper signaling and the cars can move, etc. Okay, but they, the government, they don't care about what is the color of your dining room, what kind of furniture you buy, where you buy it, at least not in this country, no? Maybe in other countries it's possible. Okay, so the final process or the purpose of this is to facilitate, okay, that, that the cells can work properly. Now, there are different homeostatic systems in the body, but all of them have the same types of components. They have sensors that monitor the variables, for example, the temperature, the amount of sodium, the blood pressure, and they transmit information to control centers that generally are, uh, in, for example, in different areas of the brain or organs of the endocrine system, or in the kidney, there are different control centers that manage and monitor uh, all of these signals. And then there are effectors, okay? Effectors that are activated if necessary. For example, if the blood pressure drops, okay, the effectors are going to be the blood vessels that are going to constrict to increase the blood pressure. If the blood pressure increases, the same blood vessels are going to dilate, okay, to lower the blood pressure. If we have excess water, the effector is going to be the kidney that is going to eliminate the water. If we have little water, the kidneys are going to retain water by making less urine. Simply to restore the physiologic conditions back to normal when they deviate from this set point. Okay, the sensors feel any disturbance. Okay, they compare the value, let's say, of the blood pressure Let's say we have established that the mean arterial pressure should be 90. If the mean arterial pressure goes below 90, that is a deviation from the set point. Okay, so the effectors are going to work to take it back to the set point. The same with temperature and other variables. Now, there are priorities. Okay, for our body, there are things that are more important than others. The blood pressure is the most important one. 
because if the blood pressure drops too much, the brain doesn't get blood, doesn't get oxygen. Okay, so if the body has to sacrifice other variables, for example, temperature, to maintain the blood pressure, it will do it. Exactly as we do. Okay, let's say you want to travel to uh, any country on vacation, but you realize that you need to save money, okay, to for your children's school or for something that is more important, of course, you're going to sacrifice traveling and are going to use the money for things that are really important. Now, sometimes the body fails, okay, in reestablishing the normal values and then starts working outside range. Let's say if the normal uh, blood sugar levels should be, let's say, between 70 and 100, Okay, some people have a failure in the regulation of the blood sugar levels and they normally work outside this range. It's like their body establishes a new range of what is normal. And maybe for them, for their bodies, normal means from 100 to 150. So they start working outside the range and that is possible, but that has a price. Because when the body starts working outside the normal range, other things are going to be affected. In the case of diabetes, the heart is going to be damaged, the kidneys are going to be damaged, the nerves, different components of the body. And that is what we study in pathophysiology, how the body functions under abnormal conditions, in disease. So, I already mentioned this, but I want you to have this very clear, the difference between steady state and equilibrium. Okay, these are two conditions that are stable, but to maintain a steady state, it is necessary to use energy. Remember, this is what allows us to maintain a different composition between the intracellular and extracellular compartments. You have studied in the past that inside the cells there is a lot of potassium while there is little potassium outside. And with sodium, the contrary happens. There is a lot of sodium outside the cells and very little inside the cells. So that, okay, the capacity that we have to maintain that difference is what we have steady state. Okay, and we need lots of energy with, uh, to do that. Now, equilibrium is easy. You breathe, there is oxygen in your alveoli, and the oxygen will move passively to the blood until there is the same concentration of oxygen in the alveoli and inside the blood. Okay, and then this oxygen is going to move from the blood into the cells until an equilibrium is reached and no more oxygen is transferred. But there is no need of spending energy for that. Okay, that is achieved by simply by some simple passive transport mechanisms. So this is uh, the way, okay, as I told you before, physiologists see the human body. Okay, I just wanted to refresh this concept because this is the basis of all the physiology. Okay, on the left side, we have the, in, the extracellular compartment that contains a third of the body water with very high concentration of sodium and very low potassium. Okay, the extracellular compartment is divided into intravascular and interstitial fluid that are separated by the endothelium. Sodium can move freely between the two compartments Okay, so a, an equilibrium is established between the intravascular and the interstitial fluid. Okay, the same concentration. However, there is a difference between the intravascular compartment and the interstitial space. It's the presence of proteins inside the blood that are not present in the interstitial fluid. What are those proteins? Albumin, antibodies, clotting factors, and different other proteins that we 
usually have in the blood and not in the extra uh, or, or in and not in the interstitial space. Now, notice that there is a big difference between the extracellular and intracellular compartment. Extracellular, sorry, the intracellular compartment contains two-thirds of the body water, has very high potassium concentration, low sodium concentration, and also has tons of proteins. All the proteins that we have inside the cells. Now, the most important difference is potassium versus sodium. And that is maintained by the sodium-potassium pump or sodium-potassium ATPase, pumping sodium outside the cells and potassium back into the cells. Okay, this difference in concentration of different electrolytes is what we call steady state, and it represents the unequal distribution of solutes between these two compartments. Lots of energy are necessary to maintain this. For this to work, we need oxygen. Okay, for need to work, we need uh, to provide ATP. Okay, ATP is made in the mitochondria by using oxygen and glucose. That's the reason why we breathe. That's the reason why we eat to maintain this alive. If this stops, an equilibrium will be reached and death will occur. So there are many mechanisms, okay? And the regulatory control systems normally are measuring variables. We are going to be tired of seeing examples of this. Okay, they are looking for a signal that is called a regulated variable that is sensed by sensors, measuring devices. Sensors will send a signal about the value of the variable okay, to the control centers. Control centers have two components. They have an error detector or they have a controller. The error detector simply compares the signal that is receiving from the sensor to the set point. Let's go to the simple uh, classic example of the hypothalamus. Let's say our hypothalamus has the temperature of the body, the core temperature, established to be, let's say, 98. Okay, every time the core body temperature is below 98, okay, this error detector is going to compare. Okay, 98, 97. Okay, there is one degree difference. Signal. The controller is going to interpret. Okay, there is one degree difference. What should we do? That is integration. And this control, controller will send a signal to the effector. The muscles for shivering. Okay, the blood vessels of the skin for closing and maintaining temperature inside the body. Okay, and all of these responses. And also to our brain cortex. So we do something about the temperature. We either put a coat or clothes on ourselves or increase the temperature in the house, or do something, or, or simply take chicken soup. Okay, there are different responses that we can give to take the regulated variable back to normal, or to the same value of the set point. The control systems sometimes act locally, for example, in the kidney, in the lymph nodes, Okay, at the level of the capillaries, capillary networks. Okay, this local control is established by some local signals that can be, can be paracrine or autocrine. So the cells talk to each other, but only locally. Or can be long distance pathways involving the nervous system, the endocrine system, some different cytokines. Everybody uh, is talking about cytokines these days. Everybody knows what a cytokine storm is. They are becoming famous. Okay, sure, some of, some of your family, etc., and friends, in a while they are going to start asking you if they aren't yet. What is this cytokine storm? How it works? You're going to be able to explain this very well. 
So, what else? Well, this is a diagram that simply tries to represent exactly what is in the previous slide. Okay, we have in the body several variables that are regulated. Okay, not all of the variables in the body are regulated or monitored. Okay, we can measure some variables, but that doesn't mean that the body is measuring them as well. Okay, for example, the heart rate. We measure the heart rate in almost every patient. But the body doesn't measure the heart rate. Did you know that? Try to look in any medicine book, physiology book. And if I'm wrong, I would really appreciate it. Let me know if you find a sensor for heart rate in our body. Now, our body is monitoring the heart rate and adjusting the heart rate if it goes up and down. Okay, that's something that one day I said, oh my goodness, we have sensors for the blood pressure. We have sensors for sodium, for potassium. We have sensors for hormones. What about a sensor for the heart rate? Do we have one? I still haven't found one. Maybe there is, but I haven't seen it. So here we have the sensor, okay? The sensor has structures that measures the regulated variable, let's say temperature, blood pressure. Sensor sends an input to the control center that contains the error detector and the controller. Notice that the set point is a value that we can call Y. Okay, the error detector will compare X minus Y and will say what is the difference. And this difference, if there is one, is going to be sent to the controller who's going to decide what to do by telling the effector how to take the regulated variable back to the set point. Now, this looks simple, but sometimes we have a control center receiving inputs from many different sources. Okay, so the error detector has to compare and calculate many different things. Blood pressure, temperature, sodium, osmolarity, glucose, potassium, different things, phosphate. Okay, so even though might look simple here, this can get really, really, really complicated. That's why we have to go and study these things one by one and then try to imagine all of them working at the same time. And we say we can multitask. The liver is multitasks. We, we don't multitask, actually. So how it's regulated? Please, if I'm going too fast, let me know. Okay, I haven't heard anything. Okay, if you think that I'm going too fast, just let me know and make me stop. So let's take a look at the ways of regulating or the most important way that these regulatory mechanisms work. These mechanisms work by different types of feedback. The most common one is the negative feedback. A feedback is simply a flow of information along a loop that is generally a closed loop. Okay, for example, we love, at least I love, that students send me feedback about what I'm doing so I can change things. As I told you, I'm not teaching to myself. I'm teaching to my students, so the objective is not me, it's the students. It's not to show if I know or I don't know, it's to help them learning how to learn. So, flow of information. As I said before, the controller, controller establishes the set point and measures the difference between the variable and the set point. Set points may vary. Okay, for example, uh, the set point for some hormones. In females, it changes across the menstrual cycle. 
the set point for cortisol changes during the day. Okay, when we wake up at 8 a.m., the cortisol levels are very high, but when we go to sleep, they are very low. Okay, so this set point may vary according to different circumstances. The set point for temperature varies depending on if there is an infection in the body or not. That's why fever occurs. Now, when there is a difference and the difference is sensed by these systems, the effectors will act to oppose the change. If the temperature is very low, they are going to increase the temperature. If the temperature is high, they are going to decrease the temperature. That's why they are called negative, because they oppose the initial change. And this is a type of homeostatic system. Okay, I remember, I'm not sure if this is still true, but I remember the first time I studied physiology, someone told me that homeostasis can be regulated by either negative feedback or positive feedback. And I dragged that mistake for many, 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 many years until I really started studying physiology to teach. Okay? Positive feedback is not homeostatic. How can you call homeostasis something that acts to amplify the initial change? If the temperature increases and you want to increase it even more, is that homeostasis? No. Homeostasis is the mechanism that tries to take the variable back to normal, not the one that makes it worse. If there is a fire in a house, homeostasis is having a fire extinguisher applied on the fire. But if you use gasoline, that is not homeostasis. That's going to make the situation worse. Okay, so negative feedback is homeostatic. Positive feedback is not. There we have a representation of a negative feedback loop. The variable sensed by the sensor control center compares and decides what is the magnitude of the change and tells the effectors to stop or to oppose and take the variable back to the initial value, the normal value or the set point value, opposing the initial change in the variable. Then we have the, a special type of feedback that is called feedforward feedback. Okay, and there are a couple of examples that we can give. For example, the regulation of temperature. The hypothalamus normally has a set point for the core temperature, the temperature of the blood inside the body, the one that is in the brain, mainly. Okay, but when we feel that there is cold outside, or it's very hot outside, in the sensors of the skin, we start making changes to prevent that the core temperature drops. Okay, I'm inside my house, I go out, it is very cold in Florida these days. This morning was 50 degrees. Once I am outside immediately, I start shivering, I have goosebumps, I need to cover myself. And of course, the temperature inside my body hasn't changed. Okay, fit forward feedback is a mechanism that promotes a change before there is any change in the actual variable. My core body temperature is or hasn't changed at all. It anticipates any potential disturbance. It's a preventative change, so nothing happens. Okay, if any disturbance occurs, because sometimes these mechanisms, let's say I go out, I start shivering, vasoconstriction, I cover myself too much, and I may have an increased temperature inside my body, then a correction by negative feedback will be performed. The same happens with blood sugar levels. If someone eats, starts eating an ice cream, when the ice cream is in the tongue and enters in the stomach, 
our pancreas starts making insulin without any increase in the blood sugar levels. It's anticipation. Exercise, salivation are other examples. If you go to the gym daily, okay, if you decide to go now, once you are at the door, your heart rate starts increasing, your blood pressure starts increasing, your epinephrine starts going up, anticipating that because your body knows what you're going to do. Okay, this generates commands without directly sensing any change, but our body is very smart in this sense. Now, positive feedback mechanisms are not homeostatic, as I told you. In this case, a, a variable is sensed, and the action of the effectors is to reinforce or amplify. The change in the same direction, it was going up, goes up a lot more. Like it happens in the coagulation cascade, like it happens in some reactions of the immune system, that you attract some cells or platelets or neutrophils, and then you add more and more and more and more like it happens during ovulation in the menstrual cycle, like it happens during childbirth. Okay, that doesn't lead to stability. In fact, you have to do something to stop it. Once coagulation starts, you have to activate anticoagulation mechanisms to limit the formation of the clot. But it's not homeostatic. This is Notice that this is exactly the same diagram that was there for negative feedback, but here we have a light, a, a green light. So it means continue, continue doing what you were doing, amplify, amplify. Variation goes a lot beyond normal in the same direction of the initial change. And we have to talk uh, briefly, briefly today, because we are going to be talking a lot about this during all the course, about how cells talk to each other. Okay, that is a topic, the cells conversations is a topic that is always amazing. Okay, they have a language, they have signals and they don't understand each other most of the time. No, not like humans. For example, if you are driving and you expect that the one that is driving in front of you uses uh, signals to move from one lane to another, I don't know in North Carolina, but here, that's not very usual. Okay, I think it's difficult, no? If you have a cell phone in your hand, it's difficult to, to signal that you're going to change lanes or you're going to turn. But cells do, okay? Cells are very nice in this sense, unless they have a viral infection. No? That, that case is different. But normal cells do. So we're going to be talking about this in every chapter, in every, to uh, in every system that we study. Okay, the signaling process involves a complex interaction between cell receptors. Receptors can be in the cell membrane or inside the cell, in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. Involves messengers that can be hormones, can be neurotransmitters, can be cytokines or different other chemicals okay, that will bind to these receptors. And then there need, needs to be a transduction of the signal. For example, let's imagine uh, we are talking about a cell that is in the adrenal gland, in the adrenal cortex. Okay, this uh, cell is going to receive a hormone. Okay, but the hormone is going to be bound to a receptor on the cell membrane. Okay, that binding will activate a series of proteins inside the cells, like a cascade. One protein acti activates the second, this other protein activates a third protein, a fourth protein, and so on. That process is called signal transduction. And at the end of this process, something is going to happen inside the cells. Either the cells are going to divide, 
or are going to start making another hormone or is going to start making something that will maybe activate another cell. Okay? And that process has to be understood not in too much detail. We are not studying cellular biology here or biochemistry. We are studying physiology. So it has to be understood in general broad terms. Okay? Receptors can be in the cell membrane or within. Okay? The first messengers will bind to receptors. First messenger can be a hormone, for example. Then we have the transduction. The first messenger conveys information to the cell and activates a second messenger that is inside the cytoplasm or inside the nucleus. And the second messengers will activate different enzymes that will lead to different actions depending on the tissue. Okay, if it's the adrenal gland, something is going to happen, for example, cortisol production, aldosterone production. If it's the pancreas, something is going to happen, glucagon, insulin. If it's the thyroid, thyroid hormone. If it's the ovaries or the testes, well, production of estrogen, testosterone, or simply oogenesis, spermatogenesis, secretion from the cells, movement of the cells. This is the way, for example, neutrophils travel from the blood to the sites of infection and then activate other cells. Or sometimes cell death. You are going to see how, for example, when a cell has a problem that has no solution, okay, it receives a signal for apoptosis. That is like suicide. Sometimes there is a mutation in the DNA. And the cell is given the opportunity to repair the mutation. Stops the, ce the cell cycle, try to repair the DNA. Or you can't, uh, I'm sorry for you, but you shouldn't stay here with that mutation. Another cell comes, binds to it, gives a signal, and the cell simply pops, disappears by apoptosis or suicide. So we are going to be seeing some examples of these messengers, hormones, cytokines, and second messengers like CAMP, okay, or, and others. Calcium is a second messenger. Nitric oxide is a second messenger. Carbon monoxide can act as a second messenger. Reactive oxygen species, when there is inflammation, okay, the cells that are fighting produce reactive oxygen species, free radicals, that activate different things to help the body fight infections, fight different things, and make a very strong response. So here we have a summary of these signaling pathways okay, that go from the binding of a messenger until the cells make their effects. Signaling pathways represent biochemical cascades like the coagulation cascade, an inflammatory cascade, okay, some events okay, that are catalyzed by several proteins. Okay, here we have the action of the first messenger that could be a hormone, can be epinephrine, can be insulin, okay, that binds to receptors on the cell membrane. Okay, this signal is going to be a transduced okay, by proteins that are called transducers. They have different names, but the generic name is trans transducer. They transmit the signal okay, from the receptor to the cytoplasm where a primary effector is going to be activated. Okay? This primary effector will activate a second messenger that can be calcium, can be nitric oxide. And this second messenger is going to activate the secondary effectors. Okay, we hope this works perfectly fine every day in our cells, but sometimes there can be some problems. For example, if we have a low pH, that's going to be delayed. If we have excessive uh, substances like toxins, the toxins are going to react with some of these proteins and they're not going to work very well. 
if there is a medication, if there is inflammation, if there is a virus, if there are too many cytokines, these things don't, don't work. It's like you may have the best cell phone in the world and the best service, but maybe you are in the middle of the ocean and there is no signal or the signal is very weak. It's the same. But in our body, instead of signals from towers, okay, there are inflammatory conditions, there is poisoning, there are toxins, there are changes in pH, changes in sodium, potassium, electrical disturbances, okay, that can lead to not proper working of these signaling pathways and disease. This is one example of a signal transduction. This could be a hormone like epinephrine. Notice that like the hormone is binding to a receptor on the cell membrane. This protein is gonna alter the shape and it's gonna activate a transducer. The transducer is gonna activate the primary effector. Primary effector is gonna activate the second messenger and the second messenger activates the secondary effector that goes and it's responsible for the different actions that the cells make. Okay, you already have the PowerPoint, so you can, if you like it, you can look at these animations and videos so you understand this with more detail. It's very, very interesting and very complex because then for every hormone, for every substance, for every type of receptor, transducer, etc., we are going to have a totally different response. This is a very broad, generic explanation of this. These are examples of the basic types of transduction systems. Okay, for example, here we have the one that works for insulin. Okay, it's called tyrosine kinase. Here we have the one that works for epinephrine and also for some muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. It's called G-protein coupled. Here we have the one, for example, that exists in the nicotinic receptors, cholinergic receptors, okay? These are ion channels that let sodium uh, pass through, etc. These are the steroid receptors. They are intracellular receptors. Notice that they are not in the cell membrane, they are in the cytoplasm, okay? I know that for many of you, this might sound like Chinese now, but today is simply an introduction okay, of this. We are going to be studying this in endocrine system, in nervous system, and in muscular system, and also, of course, in endocrine system or reproductive, the steroid part. Okay, this is here just as an introduction. This is not that you have to study this, nothing like that. And at the end, I put there some tech home points take home points, concepts that I want you to please keep very clear, okay, what is homeostasis, the difference between the internal and external environment, okay, this is something that maybe some people don't have a very clear, uh, sometimes what is internal, what is external. Internal is not everything that is inside the body, okay, it depends. For physiologists, the internal environment only consists of the extracellular fluid. Physiology almost doesn't care, almost, I'm not saying it doesn't, almost forgets what's going on inside the cells. We are more, more concerned about the extracellular fluid. And of course, we uh, sometimes we read about the, what the cells do. Okay, but the focus of physiology is to study homeostasis, and homeostasis is the maintenance of relatively stable internal, internal environment, and the internal environment is the extracellular compartment. Biochemists, those who like cellular biology, histologists, they take care of the space inside the cells, we, just a tiny bit, okay, not too much. External is the world outside. Um, for physiologists, 
Some things that are inside the body are in the external environment. For example, if it's not in the blood, it's not inside the body. If something, something is in the stomach, in the cavity of the stomach, that is outside the body. Something is in the lumen of the duodenum, that is outside the body. Something is in the colon, in the lumen, is outside the body. Anyway, it's going to go to the toilet, right? Now, once something passes through the mucosa, now it is inside the body, okay? Variables can be regulated or not, okay? Regulated variables are sensed variables. We have receptors for them. And we have also non-regulated variables. For example, heart rate is a non-regulated variable. We don't have sensors for heart rate. What is a perturbation? Any disturbance in the internal or external environment that we aim to take back to normal. And then we have the concepts of sensor control centers that contain, remember, a, an error detector and a controller. We have a set point, which is establishes what should be the normal range, okay, around which variables might change and effectors, which are the ones that take the variable back to normal and a response, okay, which could take the variable either back to normal in the case of negative feedback or a lot beyond normal in the case of positive feedback. And this is what we had for today. Okay, I hope you had uh, at least the most important things that you need for the understanding of homeostasis. And I have to say that, uh-oh, what happened here? Are you listening? Yes, I'm listening. OK, OK. I have to say that I now realize that I didn't ask you if you have any lecture after me. Do you have anything now at five? No. Oh, oh, thank God. Because I realized, oh my goodness, it's 5 p.m. What if they have something now? They need a break. Okay, okay, okay. Perfect. Any questions? Any questions? I got a blank uh, screen. I don't know what happened here. 